Colossians chapter 5 verses 17 to 21. This is walking in the spirit part two. So Galatians chapter 5 verses 17 to 21. So grab your Bibles. Let's go through this together. And, and just uh, another warm welcome if you're listening online or via Facebook or YouTube or you're just scroll, scrolling through our channel or you just found our website and a warm welcome. Um, so last week we started uh, as we were going through the book of Galatians and we started a, um, a two-part sermon really on walking in the spirit. And so today this is walking in the spirit part two. And as we're going through the book of Galatians, verse by verse, we see that towards the end of this letter, Apostle Paul right into um, this bunch of churches that had kind of gone haywire. They'd gone kind of a bit weird. There were Judaizers who were coming into the church and they were telling them all sorts of crazy, wacky doctrines and all this and that. And so... He's been correcting their doctrine and finally he says, listen, you got to love one another. And then he tells them in order to, for all of that to happen, they have to live by the Spirit, they have to walk in the Spirit. So last week we looked at that, we looked at who the Holy Spirit was, what it means to walk in the Spirit. And we touched a little bit about the flesh. Well, today we're going to be looking at that actually, if you're not yielded to the Holy Spirit, if you're not walking in the Spirit, what's going to happen is you're going to be pursuing, you're going to be lusting after the flesh, you're going to be desiring things of the flesh. So what I want to do, I want to pray again uh, for God to have His way with His Word and for His Word to pierce our hearts and then we're going to go dry, dive right in. Lord, I just pray um, that you would speak to us right now, Lord. Uh, thank you for this church, thank you for the people listening. Thank you. If somebody's listening now who doesn't know you, Lord, that you would speak to them. By the end of this, they would be saved, Lord. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You know, every time, you know, I, I like sports and I like boxing and MMA. And they usually put a date on and, and there's always a build up. There's always these two opposing teams. They train differently. Um, there's conferences and all sorts of things. There's these two clear rivals. And there's always the big day, the big moment where that fight happens. And there's usually a clear winner. Well, today we're looking at two different oppositions, two different corners. And really, we're in the middle. We're the ref in the middle. And whichever one wins really is... The one we give into. You know, last week um, we looked at what it looks like to be walking in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, to be yielded to the Spirit, to be surrendered to the Spirit. Spirit. You know, today we want to look at what happens when you're not walking in the Spirit. Well, you end up walking in the flesh. And what comes from that are the works of the flesh. You know, first of all, what we need to understand, the spirit and the flesh are two opposing teams. Galatians 5.17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, that means they're opposite to one another so that you do not do things that you wish. This is the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Maybe you didn't know that there's a battle going on inside. And the battle is between your flesh and the spirit. The flesh is mentioned five times we find in this part of Galatians. And the word flesh, what it means, it's not talking about your skin and bones, but rather that old sinful nature that still lives within. And that's why we're gonna, one day we're going to have uh, uh, new bodies because that's going to do away with that old nature. Finally, once and for all, and it's going to be done with, and we're going to have these glorified bodies. It tells us in verse 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit. In other words, the flesh strongly wants to do the opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants. Opposite of what the spirit wants. 
Somebody said, the flesh is the part of me that does not want what God wants. It's my corrupt human nature in all its weakness and depravity. You know, once I realized I had sinned before a holy and just God, I asked for forgiveness, I repented, I meant I changed my ways about my sin, I think I no longer wanted to continue in that sin, I no longer wanted to be in the habit of that sin. What happens is I became, I become born again and the Holy Spirit lives in me, He dwells in me. The flesh that once ruled my heart, my life is dethroned. Still there, but it's dethroned. But it's always fighting to get back to that throne. It tells us in verse 17 that these are contrary to one another. The flesh and the spirit are opposite. You know, although the flesh is mentioned five times, the spirit is mentioned seven times. I find that significant. The spirit is mentioned more times. The spirit is mentioned seven times, seven, the number of completeness, of perfection. The Holy Spirit is more powerful, more important and more relevant than my flesh. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the Trinity who comes to live in us at the point of salvation. The moment I'm saved, I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he has the ability to fight the flesh. And his, his ability to oppose the flesh is constant and sure. But will only be experienced so long as I'm yielded, I'm surrendered to his control on a daily basis. As we learn to walk in the spirit, the flesh becomes increasingly less and less. This is why in verse 16 it says we must learn to walk in the spirit so we do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So we don't do the works of the spirit. Charles Swindoll said this, the phrase walk by the Spirit in verse uh, in Galatians 5.16 is another way of saying live by the Spirit or let your conduct, let your behavior be directed by the Spirit. The whole issue with this is control and the answer, the solution is surrender. Think of it this way, it's like two dogs that are just fighting, they're, there's this massive tug of war, they're fighting. Do you know what? Whichever dog that wins is the dog that you feed the most. It's the dog you give way into, you surrender to. You know, this is what happens. If I do not yield, give way, allow, openly surrender wholeheartedly to the Holy Spirit, the flesh, that old nature will naturally take control of my life. So much so that in other words, well, other way, it says that you do not do the things that you wish. I start now, the things I wanted to do, pursuing righteousness, doing all these good deeds, I don't want to do. Now, something happens. In other words, we do not do good things we ought to do, and in our best moments, we would like to do. What we would like to do in our best moments, we end up not doing it. So the answer to the solution to this, the answer is surrender, is complete submission to the Holy Spirit. That's why verse 18 says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. It is spirit dependentness, not human effortness. If that's even a word, I'm making it up. We need to be spirit dependent, not human dependent. You know, the answer to the problem of the flesh is not found in the law. It's not found in human effort to keep the law. It's not found in an outer influence of human will, human strength, or human power, or trying harder. The will of God is fulfilled through the influence of the Holy Spirit. God effectively writes the law of God, His law, on, in our hearts, on the inside, you know, this is the great work of salvation. This is the great work of us being delivered, being rescued. It is the, it is the new covenant. It is the, the new promise. It's the New Testament. And the Old Testament talks about this in Jeremiah 31, 33. And it says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I'll be their God and I shall be my people. Here's the point in all of this. 
I just recently got a petrol trimmer. It's like four in one, four in one tools in it. And when you buy it, you have to get oil, you have to get the petrol and all these different things. And I was just thinking about this the other day, like that tool, if I get my hedge trimmer, trimmer and just start whacking at my hedge, right? Yes, I might cut down my hedge, but it's gonna look ugly, but it's gonna take more work, more effort for me and I'm just going to end up frustrated, angry, and upset. But when actually I pull, pull the two-stroke engine and I use it as it meant to, you know, it's, it's, it's less easier work. When I give myself over to the manual and how to actually use the tool, and I read the instructions and I follow the instructions, I yield to the instructions, I'm going to make less hard work of this and here's the point you're either living by the power of the Holy Spirit in his strength or you're trying to do it on your own in fact when you try and do it on your own the results are going to be the works of the flesh when we rely on the Holy Spirit the result is righteous behavior and spiritual attitudes which we're going to get to next to the fruit of the Spirit next week but when you live by the law, trying to do it yourself, trying to strive, work harder in this human effort, what you're going to end up producing is that sinful behavior and attitudes of the flesh. So now Paul's going through this systematically, logically. Now he's going to talk about the works of the flesh. In fact, you know, I don't want to dwell too long on these. What I want to dwell more on are the fruit of the Spirit. So next week, that's what we're going to be starting, um, continuing on in the book of Galatians on that. Verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are. He's saying, look, the result of you being in the flesh, you can clearly see them. Now the list he gives, these aren't the only thing. He gives some. He's almost saying, come on, I know you know these, but I'm just going to have to put them down. You can almost group these into four different categories. And the first category could be the sexual sins. Second category could be religion. Third, society. And the fourth, to do a drink. Now, I have to put a disclaimer here. You know, a Christian can fall into any of these works of the flesh. But if someone's life is characterized as defined by this list, it proves that salvation hasn't taken place. There's a difference there. Me as a Christian, I might fall into one of these things. But the very last verse we're going to look at is going to explain this even further. But the person who's not saved, who doesn't have Christ on the throne of their heart, this is a list that defines them. So let's break this down, the works of the flesh. Let's start with the first category, sexual sins. It says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. You know, adultery is where we get the word. In the Greek, it's ponia. That's where the word pornography comes from. You know, it's cheating on your husband or wife. In fact, in Matthew 5.18, it actually says, the Bible tells us, it says, if you lust, after a woman you've committed adultery. So that second look, that look of lust there, Bible says you, you've, you've committed adultery. But, but I'm single. Hey, one day you might be married. You're cheating on your future husband or wife. But it, 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 no, there is no excuse. And here's the point here. A lot of times we confuse love and lust. Have you noticed the similarity between the two? Let's both start with L. They're both four letter words. Love, lust. And in our culture, there are a lot of dating shows and all kinds of things and they tell people, I am in love with someone or I've fallen in love or I've fallen out of love. You know, I think the love that they're talking about is a self-centered love. In fact, it's lust. They've fallen out of lust with someone. They've fallen in lust with someone. So he talks about uh, adultery, talks about fornication, not being pure, 
before marriage, we live in a culture where it's okay to move in and sleep with someone who is not your husband or wife and it's accepted, it's kind of seen as the norm. The Bible always has said that there's certain things that are for the marriage bed. Clearly, it's in scripture. And so, Paul saying, look, these are a result of the works of the flesh. He goes on and talks about uncleanness, another word for that, and purity. It's meaning more uncleanness in thought, word, and deed. It's not just enough that maybe you haven't committed the act, you haven't done it, but you have you thought about it, you've toyed about it. You know, God's standards are so holy. They are so higher, they're so much higher, the expectations are so much higher than what we would say that God says, look, even you thinking about it, it counts as you doing it, you've sinned. Now maybe you're just somebody who just locked in or you haven't been to church in a while and you just hearing these things, you're like, you know what, tick, that's me, tick, that's me, tick, that's me. What do I do with this? What do I do with all of this? The Bible tells us that those who are still in their sin, they stand condemned already. They, there's a sentence, but tells us, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So here's the point. If you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, first of all, you realize, like, look, do you know what? I'm a sinner. I've been sinning. I've been doing the wrong thing. I've sinned against the Holy God. That there's good news. That Jesus Christ made a way so you can have a new relationship with God. A brand new, total, 100% relationship with God and that your sins are forgiven. And perhaps maybe you're listening to this and in your mind you're like, I want that. You know, God can hear you. And if you've done that or you've made a commitment towards the end of this video, you know, we want to know about it. Please email us at admin at pillarcc.co.uk or flag us up on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever. You know, we want to connect with you. We want to know um, when you made the commitment and we want to help you in as much as we can. So he talks about uncleanness, talks about lewdness. You know, it's just a lack of shame. You know, the watershed, it used to be there was nothing that was kind of impure before nine, but that's out the window. There are all kind of crazy shows that just show off all kinds of walks and all kinds of parades and all kinds of things. It's that shamelessness is gone. It's been replaced with a pride that I am prideful of my sin, I am proud of my lust. I'm prideful of what I'm doing. And in fact, I want you to give me a badge of honor. I want you to publicly say that I'm doing a good job. You know, that is the last mark of society, isn't it? When our conscience, you know, our conscience, that it comes from a Latin word meaning with knowledge where we have the knowledge to know that what we're doing is immoral, or it's not right, but yet we still continue to do it. What happens is our conscience becomes dead and it doesn't work properly. In fact, it's insensitive and it doesn't work anymore. We no longer know that, you know what, that's shameful, that's not right. What I'm doing is wrong. We no longer are sensitive to it. Lewdness is this excessive sensual behavior, lack of restraint, the no restraints you're going for it. So the second section is talking about religion. It says in verse 20, idolatry and sorcery. You know, idolatry is anything we put before God, whether it's worshiping a false image or a false God. Even good things can be idols. But here's what's interesting, sorcery. Now when we think of this, we're thinking of potions and kind of spells and kind of things. But here's what's interesting. If you have a different Bible translation, it'll say witchcraft. You know, this would also, under all of this sorcery, it would, things like conjuring up spirits to produce some kind of result, 
people who read palms and fortune tellers and it also includes the area of recreational drugs how, how can we justify how do we know well the Greek word is the word pharmakia where we get the word pharmacy pharmaceutical and John MacArthur said this that in the back in the days in those pagan days where there was that sorcery there was a lot of drugs it was a drug induced spells and sorcery and witch doctory that was going on at the same time you know America has a huge problem in the legalizing of marijuana and, and it's a it's a big business you know even worse in America and in the UK uh, a lot of people are addicted to prescription drugs in the sense that this is this is from a survey that was submitted to the NHS it said one in four people are taking and I quote addictive prescription medicines such as antidepressants sleeping pills and opioid painkillers and a lot more people are becoming so dependent on these Paul goes on and he says you know these all these things are works of the flesh then he goes to a third category and says when it comes to society and it says, it, lists, it says, hatred, you know, this is strong feelings of you really are hostile towards someone, towards an individual or a group of people, you know, and you're not even willing to work it out. You hang on to that anger and you allow bitterness to grow in your heart. You know, hate equals murder, the Bible tells us. That if you hate your brother, you've committed murder, it's the same as killing them goes on and talks about contentions, well, strife, discord, divisions. But it normally starts with that hate, isn't it? You hold on to it, and sooner or later you see that person and divide. And this is what happens, sadly, in churches. This is what happens in society. Neighbors, brothers, sisters, who haven't talked to each other for, for years. And it starts with a disagreement and somebody holds on to that hate talks about jealousies, wanting what other people have, always going to have somebody with more. You're always going to have that. Somebody is going to be better than you, they're going to have a better car, they're going to have a better, you name it. And being content is such a weapon, such a, such a secret that you can use, especially against feeling like this. J.C. Penney was known, you know, he had more money than he could spend, more money than sense, but he always said, just one more dollar. Just one more. Just one more. It was the pursuit of money, the pursuit of this happiness. Outbursts of wrath. Fits of anger, bursts of anger. Do you know, I just, I just went upstairs. Now, all my clothes, they're, they're folded in categories. So you have the long sleeves, you have the polo shirts, you have the shirts. And my children were playing in our bedroom. And... I just went in and all the clothes are ever and it was their bedtime i wanted to wake them up like you are going to fold it i don't care if you're two or six you're going to fold those clothes back up and i realized you know what this is a lot of anger i need to come right down i need to come right down it's not the right way i'll get them in the morning i'll have them in the morning but in an outburst of wrath you know, you look at videos of road rage where somebody just completely loses it because somebody cut them up. Or a Sunday driver is, is driving really, they're driving to the speed limit, but the driver is so slow and somebody gets so angry, they just burst out. They just burst out there. They're not even in control. It's almost as if that anger has taken control of their life. And they're almost watching thinking, am I really doing this? I don't know if you ever had that moment where you're that angry, you're almost watching yourself um, do whatever you're doing. It says all those things are works of the flesh. Selfish ambitions. You know, at the end of the day, with all this list, it's, it's just trying to please self. It's not even other-centered, it's self-centered. It's self-centeredness. It's only thinking about you. Dissensions, it talks about. Disagreements that lead to a split. 
It's the result of self-centered people because they only think about themselves. They don't care about anyone else. So guess what? They're going to end, end up walking away or people walking away from them. Heresies, teaching that is against the opposite of the word of God. We are being hit every single day from the media, from TV, whatever you watch. It's, it, it's, it's, it's speaking a different Bible. It's speaking a different teaching. You know, we gotta be careful what we let our children watch. You know, it might seem innocent, but you know what, it's slowly influencing them. You know, every song uh, can be a sermon, every TV can be a teacher. And we need to be really careful. We need to guard and protect, especially our children against that. So it's envy, you want what somebody has, and it angers you that you don't have what they have. Instead of congratulating somebody, saying, wow, you've done a great job, this is where you are, praise God, you'd rather have what they have. Envy and murder, unlawful, unlawful, intentional killing. And lastly, he ends the category, and he talks about drink. He says, drunkenness, reveries, Drunkenness being controlled by alcohol, you know, there's a balance there. Um, this is talking about drunkenness. First Corinthians 6.10, it says, No drunkard will inherit the kingdom of heaven. This is where the alcohol is controlling you. You are not in control anymore. Reveries, it's talking about unruly, boisterous behavior, drinking parties or drinking orgies, as, as some translations call it. And then finally, it ends with a warning and it says, Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, Paul here, the warning here, he's not talking about an act of sin, but a habit of sin. You know, Christians who are just trying to pursue righteousness, who are trying to live according to what God says in his word, you know, we might fall, we might even fail, but we're convicted and we repent and we keep on struggling. There is a failure there, but it's momentary, it's not continuous, it's not habitual. There's a fight going on, there's a struggle that's going on. Whereas the one who's not going to inherit the kingdom of God, this is what defines them. They don't care about changing. In fact, they don't want to change. They want to stay exactly where they are. Well, I want to ask you a question today. You know, maybe you're a Christian, or maybe you've known God all your life, but yet you realize, you know what, I haven't been living right. Or maybe you didn't even know God, and you come to this point here, and you're like, you know what, a lot of the things on that list, that's me. Or maybe you're somebody who's struggling with a lot of these things and you just don't know what to do. Well, you know, the answer is Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ. We go to him. The Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's what I love about the Bible. When it says confess, the Greek word, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a present participle. It means to keep on confessing and he'll keep on forgiving. You know, it's, it gives me hope when I realize, you know what? I still struggle with this. I still, I fail at this. But yet the righteous man, the righteous person will keep getting up. It's the Holy Spirit who's going to help me. He's going to clean me from the inside out, sanctification. He's working in me. He's changing me and his work is not, it's not finished yet. Do you know what? That gives me hope. That gives me something to live for. It just lets me know and have grace for my brother or sister when I realize, look, they might struggle in another area where I might be strong in. And at the same time, I might struggle in an area where they're strong in. And I just realized we're just whips, we just works in progress. And that's what allows me to be able to put other people and to love them. And I realize, look, they fall short and I fall short. And I want to encourage you, if you're somebody 
who's never had made that commitment, may, never made that change to say, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. I want His Holy Spirit. I want to yield. I want to walk in the Spirit. Well, I want to encourage you today. I'm going to, I'm going to pray. And my wife is going to end with one more song. And I want to encourage you if perhaps maybe one or two of these things have hit home today. I want to encourage you to do, do business with God. For you to go to Him and pray to Him. If you're sitting together as a family, maybe perhaps have a time of prayer as a family. And encourage one another. And I really want to thank you for listening today. And I pray that you are saying stay safe. And that in during this time where this is the new normal for now, that we wouldn't lose hope. We remember that we have a Holy Spirit who dwells in us, and that He gives us power, He gives us that strength, and that also He's our security to know that we belong to God. So I'm going to pray, and my wife is going to lead us in one more song of worship. Father God, I just thank you if there are any who have confessed, who have said they want to know you, they want to repent of their sins, Lord, that they would uh, get in contact, Lord, but you would also do business with them, Lord, and that you would just assure them that they have received that forgiveness of their sins. And Lord, I just pray for any Christians or people who have been walking and just want to rededicate, who just want a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, who are like... Do you know what? I've just been hacking at this hedge of life on my own. And, I, and I've been relying on the Spirit. I've been relying. I've been, I've been doing it all not the right way. Lord, I pray for those who are saying in their hearts, Lord, that you would help them to see that your Holy Spirit is there. In Jesus Christ I pray. Amen.